about it. Imagine you're just a little kid. You sit down at lunchtime and watch your favorite programming block, and there's one cartoon segment that airs in between shows, and it just so happens to be your favorite. It brings you nostalgia. It gives you those uncanny valley chills. It just evokes some sort of feeling. The show isn't really advertised all that heavily, and the program is really just there to fill in the half hour time slot. Years later, you grow up, maybe even start a family of your own, and something you see or hear reminds you of this preschool segment. Not even remembering the title, you go to look it up with the little memories you have of it. And to your surprise, nothing can be found. The longer you search, the more it begins to feel like you were one of the few people to even know that this segment that once aired on live television even existed. Coming up empty-handed, the show is now lost in a void and is nothing but a faint memory. Have you ever had that? A lot of us would consider that to be lost media. There are forums, archives, and even YouTube channels dedicated to uncovering hard-to-find media. People on these sites come together and dedicate years to collecting clues. Lost media communities have become so increasingly popular to the online space that they've even repurposed the conspiracy theory iceberg and used it to chronicalize all of the documented lost media, beginning with the most familiar and well-known, descending into the weird, impossible to find, and completely obscure. So obscure even that the majority of media in this category could very well be just a collective Mandela effect amongst a small group of people. And watching these people work to solve these mysteries and scrolling through these endless threads is absolutely amazing and I love every second of it. People on these sites have been known to uncover some amazing finds, whether it be finding old cartoons almost no one remembered, releasing lost anime dubs to the public that barely had any known physical copies, to uncovering recorded and unreleased music that's been locked away for years. And you really get to thinking, how is this stuff so hard to find? We live in a digital age where everything can be so readily found on the internet with a population of over 7 billion people. And you're telling me no one has a full copy of Sabe and Moon? As a passive viewer, there's something so satisfying about watching these mysteries unfold. So I can't imagine what that gratification must feel like for these people who are so dedicated to uncovering and preserving pieces of history that everyone thought was lost or just plain old never existed. Can you imagine having this continuous nagging thought in the back of your mind as you try to retrace your steps around a foggy memory and there's this compulsion to keep digging and then finally the nagging voices stop once you've figured out the mystery and have scratched that insatiable itch. You could really lose yourself in this rabbit hole of finding potential clues and breakthroughs on something that once felt like a cold case. Well, in the last couple of months, I got to experience that feeling firsthand. I took myself from the role of passive observer to full-blown internet detective. Hi, um, I'm Raven Simone, I make videos online, and I want to uncover the mystery surrounding the unreleased Mean Girls DS game. Why? It's Mean Girls. A game that almost nobody was excited for, set to be released by the end of 2008. The months rolled by, and that game was never released. Its disappearance went completely unnoticed, until suddenly it didn't. People as a collective went from joking about this title to asking ourselves where it could have gone, and very quickly its disappearance created its own online cult following. I want to be the first to find this valuable shovelware that's been shrouded in so much mystery over the years. And if I'm not the first to find it, well, then I hope whatever I do find on my way there can be used as a blueprint for anyone else out there that wants to continue the search for this game. Although I started this series with the intention of finding the Mean Girls DS game, through my search, I fell down a rabbit hole leading me to nothing but dead ends and cold trails. But miraculously, on my way out, I stumbled upon a gold mine of unreleased and unseen lost media linked to the Mean Girls DS game that I never expected to get my hands on. Oh my god! <laughs> Follow me as I explore the girl games of lost media.
2008 was a pretty phenomenal year for the people over at Nintendo. The Wii and the Nintendo DS topped the US game console sales charts for 2008, beating out competing US hardware sales that year, surpassing consoles like the Xbox 360, both the PlayStation 2 and 3, along with Sony's handheld device, the PlayStation Portable. The most remarkable detail was perhaps that DS sales accounted for nearly triple the amount of PlayStation 3 units sold, rethroning Nintendo as a dominant force in the gaming industry once again, who only a few years prior was struggling to compete with Sony and Microsoft after falling behind in sales with their release of the GameCube in 2001. The company was back on top. The Nintendo DS became a mainstream and global success and managed to be the first handheld console to have a universal appeal that hit virtually every target demographic. This was due largely in part to core decisions made by the late Nintendo president Satoru Iwata, who had the goal in 2003 for their next generation of consoles to spark a gaming revolution as an attempt to bounce back from the poor sales of their previous console. Mr. Iwata wanted this upcoming console to focus less on computational and graphics power and instead reinvent the system's interface to target a broader demographic of players. This time, the plan was to win over not just the sons, but the entire family. And as a result, Nintendo introduced more mature titles to the Nintendo DS with games like Brain Age and Touch the Dead and successfully pulled in a larger and previously thought to be harder to reach female demographic with titles like Animal Crossing, Cooking Mama, and The Sims. The console's hardware was a standout success for being innovative and easy to use for seasoned, new time, and casual players. These core changes had moms, dads, sons, daughters, and even grandmas getting down with the new hardware, placing the company back at number one. The entire Nintendo DS product line went on to become the most sold handhelds worldwide with a whopping 154 million units it's moved since its release. And with this massive increase in profit, large corporations, primarily in film and media, wanted to capitalize on its success. Big studios saw the potential to make money and did what they did best. And what happens when something achieves widespread success and makes a large profit with consumers? We got ourselves some good old fashioned exploitation of goods. As a response to this financial windfall in the gaming industry, we saw a ton of licensed games be birthed from big studios attempting to profit from the reach of the Nintendo DS. Frankly, some licensed games were actually very well made and found their own levels of success and popularity among consumers, but a lot of these are considered to be rare gems and few and far between in a sea of poor quality games that were the results of rushed production cycles so games could be turned out alongside big budget blockbuster film releases or an unsavory amount of companies that would pay developers to produce out of time touch low quality material in an attempt to throw any idea they had at the wall in the hopes that one would land with gamers. It was very common for an old movie that came out decades before the release of the DS to suddenly have its own game, which more often than not had little to nothing to do with the original film. If there was an active license on an IP, better believe it would be squeezed dry. And it was around this time that a certain entertainment company had their sights set square on infiltrating the female Mel Gaming Market. On July 22, 2008, an article posted to GameSpot announced that Paramount Digital Entertainment and Legacy Interactive were turning the films Pretty in Pink, Clueless, and Mean Girls into DS and PC games slated for the end of the year. A representative at Paramount Digital Entertainment told GameSpot that the company was looking to expand its gaming operations on PC, consoles, handhelds, and the iPhone with an eye toward expanding the core casual gaming audience. That's right. Are you a lover of the 80s? Well, get ready for Pretty in Pink on the PC, a puzzle game in which players determine whether Molly Ringwald's character Andy chooses between the hunky Blaine or the outcast Ducky. Or perhaps you'd like to try your hand at playing matchmaker for your friends in the game Clueless, where you play 90s fashionista Cher Horowitz and are tasked with hooking up your friends with the right guy by judging their interests and wardrobe sensibilities. Available for the Nintendo DS and PC. And if love matching isn't quite your 
forte, maybe dethroning and overthrowing an elitist high school clique might be more up to your speed. In Mean Girls High School Showdown for the PC, play as a new high school student to North Shore High with the mission of taking down the popular girl clique known as the Plastics. Restore order to the high school by either transcending petty social norms or by fighting fire with fire. Who says politics can't be fetch? And of course, hardly anyone was receptive to this announcement. The general consensus from viewers was that these games would just be typical shovelware and would most likely be shoddily produced. And some of these responses posted around the time of this article's release, well, let's just say they definitely spoke to the times. Every movie-based game always turns out a crap sandwich. If Mean Girls gets good review, I'm buying it. But if it doesn't, eh, I'll wait a year or two until it becomes one loony. <laughs> I know it's a slow news. Tuesday, but seriously, GameSpot, come on. This just set women gamers back a few years, I think. This is why I hate being a girl gamer. This is a joke, right? <laughs> Please, lol. I loved Clueless back then, but there is no way I'm going to play the game. There are free Flash games created by middle schoolers on the internet that sound much better than these games. This message was deleted at the request of the original poster. Yo, is it me or do even great movies always become terrible games? And as colorful as some of these comments were, I didn't necessarily disagree with the general skepticism regarding Paramount's announcement, and it made sense why a lot of people disregarded the entire thing as an attempt to exploit the female gaming demographic. Firstly, the Nintendo DS had already been out since 2004. Perhaps more people would have been on board with this if the more relevant title Mean Girls was released closer to the date of the original film. But in Instead, this announcement came a whole four years later, bundled in with two other films, Clueless and Pretty in Pink, which came out almost one and a half decades earlier that no one was even really talking about anymore. On top of all this, the games were slated for the end of 2008, yet were announced July of that same year. So unless they had been working on this all in the dark a few years prior, it's easy to assume that with only five months left of the year, the games would have been put through a very sloppy production cycle. It it just didn't seem like an earnest release and felt much more like a rushed attempt at capitalizing on popular films of the past that Paramount still had lying around in their possession. They didn't seem to realize that consumers were kind of tired of all the shovelware. Homeschooled. That's really interesting. Thanks. But you're like really pretty. Thank you. So you agree? What? You think you're really pretty. The 2004 American teen comedy Mean Girls was a box office success and cult classic, and its quotes and most iconic moments continue to stand the test of time, living on in pop culture references to this day. By 2008, lead actress Lindsay Lohan's mental health and public image were a hot obsession with tabloids, so the spotlight was heavily placed on not only the announcement of a Mean Girls DS game, but also the controversy regarding Lindsay Lohan's exclusion on the game's box office. Rachel McAdams is taking over the gaming world. The Canadian cutie, along with Lacey Chabert and Amanda Seyfried, graced the box cover of the upcoming Mean Girls Nintendo DS game. And noticeably absent from Rachel's side, the film star, Lindsay Lohan. Although there weren't many people anticipating these games from the start, Lindsay Lohan's reputation in the public eye, compounded with the fact that Mean Girls was the more culturally relevant film of the three, inevitably overshadowed any press on the announced Clueless and Pretty in Pink games. They had faded into the back in an already dark room. As expected, none of these games came out by the original release date scheduled for the end of 2008. Fast forward to March of 2009 and all three games, Mean Girls High School Showdown, Clueless and Pretty in Pink are all released as free online games developed by Legacy Interactive. Along with a retail release with all three games included, known as the Oh My God High School Triple Play Pack. And nobody cared. But what about the announced DS title? Surely that would have stirred up more buzz. In September of that same year, the tie-in Nintendo DS game was scheduled to be released in Europe with a North American release slated for April of the following year. September rolls by? 
nothing. April of 2010 approaches, and still nothing. The game never came out, and its disappearance went seemingly unnoticed, with no updates posted on Paramount Entertainment's behalf. And with every anniversary of the film's release, or on October 3rd, you'll always have a handful of fans reminiscing about the cultural impact of the Mean Girls movie, showing their love and appreciation for the film through various memes and quotes. And I think it must have been around this time that the discourse on the rumored Mean Girls DS game suddenly began to resurface on public forums. People on forums began to wonder where the DS game had gone and whether or not it even existed. Growing suspicions on the game's cancellation began to pop up, with people speculating that the cancellation was due to bad publicity of actress Lindsay Lohan, while others believed the game was completed and released, only to be promptly pulled from shelves due to poor ratings. Countless lost media users have attempted to find both physical and digital copies of the Mean Girls DS game, with most searches leading to a dead end. Fans did manage to uncover five alleged screenshots from the game that surfaced on an obscure Italian website, and the game was even found listed on retail websites like Best Buy and Walmart, along with being posted to the official entertainment software rating board website with its own ESRB rating. In this adventure game, players assume the role of a new high school student that makes friends and enemies with all the characters from the Mean Girls movie. Players complete tasks, interact with characters, and follow the text-based conversations. Many of the conversations contain suggestive references. For example, were they kissing kissing? Or were they just kissing? Girl, you crazy. I like my women with a little more color. And... If any of you have babies over the summer, don't name them Anferny. A character also uses the expletive damn once in the dialogue. Holy shit, this is weird. <laughs> is this the ESRB? What the fuck is this? This is the it. What? Is this like legit, like on their website? This is ridiculous. This is really funny. This was convincing evidence enough to keep many lost media users motivated in their search. With a handful of promotional in-game screenshots acting as a lead, it was just further confirmation to many that there was someone out there who was no doubt in possession of this game, whether it be a physical or digital copy. Evidence was being regularly updated and logged onto various lost media and wiki articles, and pretty soon comments began to pop up from users claiming to have seen the game on store shelves at some point in time, along with a handful of conflicting accounts of people claiming to be in possession of the game, ultimately leading to a cold trail once people challenged and poked at the validity of their claims. Hi, before you say that I'm a fake, please read and I swear I am telling the truth. When I was younger, me and my family took a trip to England in 2009. We needed to take a break around 2pm. I had my DS with me. My dad went into the gas station right by a game store and when he got out, we went into the game store. I remember seeing Mean Girls in the section of the aisle titled New Games. I did not really think that much, just thinking that it was a slap together movie game for 12 or 11 year olds who loved the movie so much. Also, it was not much. It cost around $5.99. I got Mario Karts instead. In 2016, I saw a video talking about Mean Girls. I was shocked. I remembered the name of the store and I called the store and the lady on the phone said, sorry, we do not have the game anymore due to only one person buying it. Sadly, the store was going to close anyway. And whoever did buy it, it was probably a teen girl that is now lying in a teenage girl's closet covered in clothes. Wow, that's a nice story. Too bad it's fake. I have this game in storage. Back in like 2010, 2011-ish, my sister had just watched Mean Girls, and when they learned of the game, they got it from my aunt. One way or another, it ended up with me, and now it's somewhere in storage. I don't remember much from the game, but I do know it existed, and it was a real thing. Pixar, it didn't happen! Have you found it? I doubt anyone would even find a single copy of this game anytime soon. <laughs> I want to say that in 2019, on a trip to Italy to visit my family at a local thrift store chain called Mercatino Delusato in Torino, Italy, I saw a copy of Mean Girls DS and I think it was around 5 euros. Unfortunately, I did not pick it up because I did not know it backstory. I will ask my cousin Paolo to go to that store and look for it as soon as things start to open up back there again. Hope this helped and we'll let you all know if he finds it. For some reason, I doubt this story. I've heard of so many tales of this game that go in a similar format that I've pretty much stopped believing them. 
Can you provide proof if you even did sign it? So, did these people actually see the Mean Girls DS game tucked away in bargain bins at their local retailers? Was it all just a Mandela effect with the public? Could there be any validity to any of these claims? Or maybe it was all just blatant trolling to work people up. Despite the community's best efforts, ROMs and physical copies of this game still have yet to surface. The intrigue surrounding this game's disappearance has since gained almost as much notoriety and cult following in the gaming and lost media community as the the film did with the mainstream media, and it always seems to find itself on everyone's lost media iceberg. And that's where we jump back to me. Hi. Yeah. Remember me? We've been at this for so long, I feel like I've completely veered off the main points of this whole thing. But I'm sorry, you just had to know the backstory. And now that you're up to speed with all the lore, I could finally take you through my whole investigation into this thing. So sit back, because you're in for a bit of a whirlwind. The first thing I noticed when searching through the wikis and lost media articles was the lack of consistent information posted about the game. Information didn't match up. And I'm not just talking about inconsistent release dates, but there was even confusion about what companies were handling the game. I saw comments from users claiming to own the Mean Girls DS title, only to link the PC version of the game. And with both Mean Girls High School Showdown and Mean Girls DS having their own individual ESRB ratings and completely unique summaries, I just knew they couldn't be the same. Not only that, but one was clearly developed by Legacy Interactive, with the other being released under 505 Games. So I figured clearing up this confusion would most likely be the perfect place to start, because once I knew where everything came from, it would be much easier to zero in on the details. And in order to sort this whole thing out, we really need to rewind back to our starting point, because it turns out a lot of people fail to realize that there's not just a ton of confusion and misinformation about this game's whereabouts today, but that this misinformation started all the way back from when the initial announcement was made on the GameSpot website. There are so many inconsistencies within that one article that I hadn't seen anyone really point out and dissect. So yes, that's right. This article right here, it's fake news. Well, not entirely. Here, let me explain. So when we go back and look a little deeper at this article, the funny thing is, the headline announces that Paramount Entertainment's films Mean Girls, Pretty in Pink, and Clueless would be turned into PC and DS games. Except when you actually read the article, they only really explain a synopsis for the first three legacy interactive PC games, and makes no mention of a Nintendo DS release or summary for the Mean Girls game. Also, this should kind of go without saying, but please don't give the author a hard time time for this misreport. It's just a nice disclaimer to have. Remember, they were one of the very few journalists to even write about the announcement, and with hardly anyone else looking into it, and with little press Paramount decided to do, it's easy to see how some things could get lost in translation, so I commend them for even attempting to sort through this mess. Anyways, let's continue. In fact, the only time they mention the Nintendo DS is when referencing to a supposed clueless game. Yet after this article, anything that preceded it focused solely on the Mean Girls DS game game, which was the only game to even be reported on or marketed to the public. And I feel like this is why it was so easy for some people to give up on their search and assume the DS release was a port of the PC game, until screenshots leaked. So what happened there? Honestly, I think it all boils down to a lack of press. There was hardly any public interest about these games being released. So right off the bat, there were conflicting reports on Paramount's plans with not enough news outlets covering it to really set the record straight. The article failed to even mention the Mean Girls game, but it was made very clear soon after that there was, in fact, an upcoming DS title by 505 Games. And this had been reported on a couple of times and was even evident from the released box Art. So, with a new target in sight, on April 24th, 2017, Lost Media Wiki user Flutter reached out to 505 Games and received the following message. Hi Flutter, thank you for contacting 505 Game Customer Support. We've been getting a consistent flow of tickets about this game, mostly from Lost Media Wiki. Everything that's listed there is all that we know and all that is publicly released. The game itself never made it to market, so there are no additional details that we have to offer, as this is a cancelled title from over seven years ago. My apologies for the inconvenience, Kyle. 
505 Games customer support. And that was it. After reaching out, fans received a pretty inconclusive answer with no more potential avenues to explore. And this is where the confusion between publishers and developers really started. People had concluded that 505 Games developed the Mean Girls DS game. It's the only company branded on the box art, and their title of game developer is even listed on the Lost Media Wiki page. But this was in fact false. In actuality, 505 Games were the publishers of the Mean Girls DS game, so for that reason, their response here actually makes sense. As publishers, how much could they really know regarding the development of a game? Publishers are only responsible for the marketing, sales, and PR of a game. It's actually the developers who are tasked with the creation of it. It felt like a dead end because we were asking the wrong people. If I wanted to dive deeper, I needed to go to the people who actually worked on or were in charge of creating this game. And up until then, people had just assumed it was 505 Games. And I can't even blame them for that either, it's not like they made it very easy to find. Although it's not listed anywhere on the box art, the game was actually developed by a company known as Crush Digital Media. And this was confirmed by a developer by the name of Philip Corner, claiming to be an ex-employee at the company who was able to share further details on the game through a YouTube comment in response to the gamer for Mars' video on the same subject. I was a developer on this game. I'm surprised there are people out there trying to find it, but it's nice that something I worked on isn't entirely unloved. At Gamer from Mars, you might have seen my reply to your post in a recent video by Nintendo, so I'll give you a little more information here regarding some specific things this video brings up. The Kotaku article mentions it might be a Puzzle Quest ripoff. No, there's no gameplay like that in Mean Girls DS. It seems to be talking about the PC version. The game does feature a lot of talking between characters, as depicted in the PC version. Version, but presumably they switched out all the mini games with just the one puzzle game. I hadn't heard of the PC version until this video, so I can't say for definite. Crush Digital Media, the company developing Mean Girls, were based in Annesley near Nottingham, England, although 505 are based in Milan. They must have had a UK office too because we had a representative visit quite often. I believe Crush went bust before it was finished, but I'm fairly sure it was finished later by Fuzzy Frog. Although Crush completed two games, I don't think anything was ever released so you may find it difficult to find out anything about them. I had almost forgotten about the mini games. All I could remember was the dancing and fireworks games. Regarding the weird final game with the dots around the zebra's head, you have to trace the picture as quickly as possible, i.e. go through all the dots, then a new one appears. The more you do, the more you impress the boy because joining the dots is what teenage boys look for in a girl, I guess. I'm sorry I don't know definitively whether the game was actually released or not. I actually didn't do much work on this game and I would have been working for a new company at the time it was released, so I never bothered to check. I mostly worked on Beauty Salon, another game which Amazon alleges was released, but I don't think it actually was. We definitely did finish that Mean Girls game though. Honestly, with the new information he was able to provide, I was more inclined to believe he was telling the truth. He seemed to be the real deal. And with the confusion surrounding who developed this title all cleared up, we could now narrow down the search even further as we had two new leads, Crush Digital Media and Fuzzy Frog Entertainment. So I did what any sane internet detective would do and I looked up any and all of the names associated with both companies over on LinkedIn. Yep, I shot them an email. And these were not very easy to find. With both companies being so small and having shut down so long ago, I found myself being led to 10 other crushed digital medias until I was sure I landed on the right one. Fuzzy Frog, however, was much easier to dig up. As it turns out, after development was passed on from Crush Digital Media to Fuzzy Frog, Fuzzy Frog was later acquired by a company known as Hugh Go Games. That was now three separate developers that were potentially involved in the creation of one cancelled game. And I thought things couldn't get any more confusing. So I did what I could and sent emails to literally everyone I could find. And then I waited. Okay, so someone at Fuzzy Frog actually got back to me, and uh, he said I could send him a handful of questions. Basically, he said, hey, Raven, thanks for reaching out. It's not one of the games in a career that you think is going to pop out of nowhere, smiley face. <laughs> I'm not sure I can offer much information, but to be honest, I'm happy for you to send over some questions, and I'll see if I can recall any information. So I sent him the questions, but unfortunately, it's, it's been a few weeks, and he hasn't replied, so I don't really want to spam him, but... I think I might have hit another roadblock. Uh, 
I guess we can wait it out a little longer and wish me luck and hope he replies. And unfortunately, after weeks of waiting, the trail went cold. I got no response, but I wasn't ready to give up. I had already come so close in my search and managed to unearth more new finds that I never imagined I'd come across. So why stop now? I needed to think outside the box. I hit a dead end after reaching out to the developers, but what if I could pick up clues from somewhere a little further back? I managed to get so much intel when I retraced my steps the first time, so I thought, why not give it a go again from a second angle? Maybe I'd end up finding something new. So remember when I said that old game GameSpot article from 2008 was full of inaccuracies that caused a lot of confusion? Well, it had also included a bit of an easter egg, an overlooked detail that would put me back on the chase. In my attempt to sort out all the confusion between games, it almost completely went over my head that I was in fact trying to rearrange a puzzle consisting of not just one game, but five. Mean Girls High School Showdown, Clueless the Game, Pretty in Pink, Mean Girls DS, and Clueless Fashion for the Nintendo DS. There it was in plain sight. It was the only Nintendo DS game to be mentioned in the original article, and it somehow managed to get lost and pushed to the wayside in all of the Mean Girls hype. It was so strange that I never even bothered to turn my attention to this little detail upon reading through the article, and I'm guessing many others didn't zero in on this either as it largely went unnoticed. A second cancelled title by 505 Games. I was what you would call a little bit clueless. Okay. Please excuse the bad joke. Rewinding back to this, it made so much sense. But why wasn't anyone really talking about this? Paramount Entertainment had planned to release both Mean Girls and Clueless on the Nintendo DS. Similar to Mean Girls, it was the only other DS game announced by Paramount at the time. It had a handful of screenshots leaked online, the game had its own box art, along with its own ESRB listing, separate from the Legacy Games title. And it was published by 50 five games, which we now know likely did not handle the development. With all these similarities between the two, why wasn't anyone really looking at this? Completely overshadowed by the Mean Girls controversy, this game was also considered a piece of lost media as it was never released. There's no game that has any closer ties to Mean Girls CS than this. I was willing to bet anything that information about Clueless and Mean Girls had to have been intertwined. So if I can find answers to one, then surely I'll be able to find more clues to the other. And that hunch was all I needed to begin my search for the lost media piece, shrouded in so much mystery. I now had my sights shifted on the game clueless fashion. The trail finally picked back up. Now, I know in 2021, Clueless has kind of come back into style with cinephiles and fashion enthusiasts. But for those of you who need a brief synopsis, Clueless is a 1995 coming-of-age teen comedy starring actress Alicia Silverstone as the character Cher, a high school student living in Beverly Hills dealing with the ups and downs of adolescent life. She's rich, blonde, pretty, popular, her dad's an attorney, and she knows exactly how to have the rest of the world eating out of the palm of her hand. Not only does Cher have an eye for fashion, but she's also a bit of a fixer-upper, with makeovers being a task which gives her a sense of control in a world full of chaos. After getting a C in her debate class threatening her average grade, Cher makes it her mission to do exactly what she knows best in order to correct the situation, which is finding a date for her teacher in exchange for a higher grade. Much of the film is focused around Cher matchmaking and giving charitable fashion and popularity advice to her new social project, Ty the new transfer student, until one day she gets tired of controlling other people's love lives and realizes that she would in fact like to find the boy of her dreams. Cher then comes to the conclusion that perhaps it is she who is the clueless one. Oh, hint? She finds the boy of her dreams at the end, and without really giving away too much of the plot, um, uh, it's just, no, no, no sweetie, please, no. But I definitely recommend you watch it at least once because it's kind of an iconic cult classic. 
The GameSpot article from 2008 made mention of an upcoming Clueless game for the Nintendo DS, but failed to provide an accurate description and instead described that of the Clueless game that was to be developed by Legacy Interactive. Fortunately, similar to that of Mean Girls DS, where it had its own ESRB entry separate from the Legacy Games title, Clueless Fashion also had its own listing. Somewhat echoing the plot of the film, the ESRB rating describes Clueless Fashion as a game in which players assume the role of aspiring fashion designer Cher, who shops, socializes with friends, and coordinates fashion shows. The player can supposedly create outfits, select hairstyles for models, as well as instruct them on where to pose on the catwalk. Now, it was just a matter of finding the developers, and it sure as heck wasn't 505 Games. Funnily enough though, unlike Mean Girls DS, information on a Clueless Fashion was actually a lot easier to find. Listed right there in its Lost Media Wiki article was the name of the developer behind the game, and the company was known as Glyphic Entertainment. Immediately after looking up its name, I was able to find a link to the Glyphic Entertainment website. It hadn't been modified since 2010, but surprisingly still remained up and running. It just sat there, perfectly preserved. According to the short blurb on their page, Glyphic Entertainment was founded in 2002 and is a privately owned, premier developer and publisher of innovative entertainment products for the Nintendo DS, consumer PC, and various mobile technologies, including Windows Power Pocket PC and smartphone devices. Formerly doing business as Pocket PC Studios, Glyphic Entertainment's catalog includes several famous entertainment brands, including Warlords, Disciples, and Ancient Evil. Through their active period, Glyphic Entertainment worked on several games such as Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, House MD, Markerman Adventures, and like listed on the wiki, Clueless Fashion for the Nintendo DS. There it was, including a brief summary of the game, along with all seven screenshots that appeared on the Lost Media Wiki. Now it was all a matter of reaching out to the development team to hopefully get more information on this lost game. But with the site not being updated for almost 10 years, I had a lot of worries that the information provided on their contact page would be obsolete or outdated and therefore wouldn't help in my search. But it was worth a shot, so I did what any sane internet detective would do. I emailed the company directly, then reached out individually to old employees at Glyph by finding them over on LinkedIn. I ended up sending a lot of emails. Odds are, with the company being so old, no one would respond, but maybe someone would remember something and maybe that someone had intel on Mean Girls. After waiting a few weeks, none of the staff had responded. And to my disappointment, the direct business email for Glyphic Entertainment didn't seem to go through either. This message was created automatically by mail delivery software. A message that you sent could not be delivered to one or more of its recipients. This is a permanent error. The following address failed. After that, I was pretty much ready to throw in the towel, and I assumed all the contacts I had reached out to were, at this point, defunct. Then suddenly, right as I was about to retire for the night, my phone lit up. What would you like to know? And there it was, with a very cryptic response like something out of a detective film, the CEO and president of the company, G.R. Moore, had somehow received the email that was previously labeled as undelivered. It felt like all the stars had aligned through some divine intervention. As it turns out, he finally got to clear his inbox. It was full this whole time. Here was the conversation that took place in a series of back and forth emails. I decided to start off with some basic warm up questions. Hi Raven, I'll provide answers to any questions I can. It has been 12 years since I've looked at any of this. Hello, I was very curious about the game your company worked on known as Clueless. Was there ever an official release for the game? No, Paramount Pictures did not release the completed project. Was the game to be released alongside the Mean Girls game published by 505 Games? No, the project was not associated with the 505 title. Are there any existing copies of the Clueless game or additional screenshots not present on your website that I could use? Use for my review? I hold the only existing ROM image and card. I'm attaching all promo screenshots from July 15th, 2008. Feel free to send any questions. I'll answer them the best I can. 
Moore proceeded to attach a total of 20 screenshots from the game, seven of which were already displayed through the company's website with an additional 14 new images that hadn't been released online. These shots included six screenshots of a catwalk minigame, four in-game dialogue between Dion and Cher, three interior shots of the boutique storefront, four images of the boutique inventory, and finally, four images of the Clueless Fashion title screen and settings options. I had hoped that there would be some overlapping knowledge of the Mean Girls DS title, but then again, it was naive to think he would have any direct knowledge aside from the game his company was commissioned to work on, even if it was a tie-in. But knowing that Moore was in possession of both the ROM image and card was eating further away at my curiosity. I just had to know more. Thank you so much! I've drafted up a few questions here. Do you know of the story behind why this game was never released to the public? Did Paramount Pictures ever give an explanation to your team? They did provide an explanation, however, that is confidential information secured by NDA. Did the game have a steady production cycle? What was that like? Did it face any delays, setbacks, major changes, etc.? Many people were under the assumption that this game had a two-year-long cycle and was to be released February 26, 2010. Nintendo Lot Check was approved for the English version in January 2009, while the European version was approved in July 2009. Development began in September 2008. There were no delays delays or changes to the base product as it was designed. The game was localized for EFIGS which is English, French, Italian, German, Euro-Spanish. Were you aware that in the last few years, people have taken to public forums such as Reddit to try and uncover parts of this lost media? A lot of people question its existence as it's often talked about alongside the missing and unreleased Mean Girls game. I wasn't aware of that. All media is held with my company, and to the best of my knowledge, I have the only DS-ROM of the game. Paramount Pictures made an announcement back in 2008 that they'd be taking their romantic teen comedy films Clueless, Mean Girls, and Pretty in Pink into the gaming market with PC and Nintendo DS games slated to be released in the coming years. Three CD-ROM games were released by Legacy Interactive and two DS games were announced from 505 Games, yet Mean Girls and Clueless Fashion never seemed to make it to the American market. Did Paramount approach your company only to take on Clueless Fashion or were they also looking for adaptations of Mean Girls and Pretty in Pink during the initial stages. We were only contracted to do this game, and we were unaware of any other titles until mid-development. And then, I hit him with the big question. Okay. In the interest of journalism, as this would mean a whole lot to girl gaming historians and, frankly, all video game historians, since many people thought the Clueless Fashion game was lost forever, would you feel comfortable either sending the ROM file over or even recording around like five minutes of gameplay to be used in the video? Whichever you're more comfortable with, if it's at all possible, that would be monumental. While I can't share the game itself due to contractual obligations, I can provide an hour-long gameplay AVI from July 2009 if you have somewhere to drop it. Sadly, the AVI didn't capture some of the 3D models during the runway minigames. I've also attached a copy of the English manual insert in PDF format. I've uploaded the AVI to your drive. No box art was created for the product as the design is typically dictated by the publisher and they canceled the project without taking that step. Thank you so much! This is amazing! Just as promised, G.R. Moore linked both the original manual insert for the game, along with an hour-long AVI file showcasing gameplay footage from Clueless DS. I finally had my hands on some pretty substantial, never-before-seen lost media, and I'd like to reveal all of it to you guys in this video. The first item I wanted to look at was a copy of the English manual insert provided by G.R. Moore. The Nintendo DS manual for Clueless Fashion is very basic in design in comparison to the inserts of competing mainstream DS titles. With it all just being plain text, it's entirely possible that at some point the manual would have had a design, including in-game images to accompany the instructions, but it either never reached that stage of development or not much thought was put into making it more detailed. With it being a fashion game though, I'm more inclined to believe that its lack of detail is because of the game's cancellation, and that they just didn't end up finishing it. As Moore did mention that the game's box art was typically dictated by the publishers, in this case 505 Games, who cancelled the project without taking that step. This would explain the lack of detail that likely would have been done after approval from 505 Games. 
Aside from the lack of detail, the manual is contained within a seven-page long PDF file, providing detailed instructions in its table of contents for the following. Getting started. Introduction. Controls. Main menu. Career. Tasks. Options. Credits. How to play. The story. The task board. Shopping. Purchasing items. Earning money. Creating garments such as setup. Cutting folding, ironing, and sewing, the dressing room, the runway, grading your efforts, what's next, and limited warranty. Even apparent in the table of contents, the creating garments section stood out noticeably among the other features listed. With its own entire page of instructions on page 5 of the PDF, these in-game mechanics being cutting, folding, ironing, and sewing was the central focus and main selling point of the game, as it was to work in tandem with the new Nintendo DS hardware at the time, being that of the dual touchscreen. To paraphrase from the manual, the most crucial step to garment making is the preparation. When making a new outfit, the player must select the correct pattern and appropriate fabric. New patterns, exotic fabrics, and fun workplace mats can be purchased at the many in-game shopping centers. When cutting garments, players could use the touchscreen and drag the stylus along the pattern marks. Folding the fabric was done by dragging the stylus over the folding marks in the direction indicated. To iron, the player could press folds and wrinkles by stroking the stylus around the iron marks until the marks disappeared. But if pressed for too long, could risk burning the fabric, leading to a lowered score. And finally, to use the sewing machine, players need to drag the stylus over to the appropriate sewing marks. Drifting too far from the marks could also yield a lower score. This interactive portion is where your tailoring skills will be put to the test, as well as the player's ability to create garments as quickly as possible, implying that some events would have likely been timed events. The second file was by far the more anticipated of the two. A full hour-long demo video showcasing gameplay footage from Clueless Fashion. While I can't showcase the clip in its entirety, in the interest of time, I'll be posting the full version over to archive.org, which you can find in the description box below. But for now, I'm just going to give it a basic rundown and brief summary of what I saw in the hour-long sequence. May I present to you, Clueless Fashion. The video had no sound, and although the demo consisted only of four chapters, being chapters 16, 17, 18, and 19, the gameplay was exactly how it was described in the original ESRB rating. Accurate to its description, in the game, Cher is chasing her dreams of becoming an up-and-coming fashion designer. Chapter 16 is labeled as Cher's first fashion show, part 2. Presumably towards the end of the game, Cher is tasked with hosting her very own fashion show, overseen by head fashion designer Jean-Luc. Just a preface from the documents I've been reading, apparently Jean-Luc Francois had two different last names. One was Francois, with the other being Jean-Luc Pretentious, which is a play on the word pretentious. But his last name is different in some of the documents, so if you hear me addressing him by two different last names, then just know it's it was in the design document. It wasn't me. The challenge begins with models running down a catwalk with button prompts occasionally popping up on the second bottom screen. The user must tap the screen screen prompts to strike poses and advance forward on the catwalk. For each catwalk challenge, you're graded on your timing, accuracy, and the overall outfits presented on the runway. Chapter 17 is quite brief and is called Expanding the Task Board. After achieving a decent score, Jean-Luc then presents the player with the opportunity of creating garments for a fashion show located in New York, run by a famous fashion designer named Rimbaud. Cher accepts. This is where we make our way to Chapter 18, titled The Winter Runway Show. Chapter 18 showcases another crucial gameplay mechanic, being the garment making feature, where surely enough, as written in the manual, you can cut, iron, fold, and stitch together differently designed fabrics to create new outfits. The video closes out at the beginning of Chapter 19, known as Winter Runway Show Part 2. The models are seen displaying the newly crafted garments being showcased on the catwalk in the second fashion show hosted in New York. Like GR Moore mentioned in his response, the sprites and assets in this portion of the demo were unfortunately only partially rendered, leaving some models without bodies as just floating limbs.
I take great solace in the fact that through my investigation, I was able to find and retrieve actual evidence of this game's existence, and was even able to uncover some previously unseen media in the process. But to paraphrase The Little Mermaid, I was craving more. I felt so close to closing the lid on this whole thing and revealing the ROM in its entirety, but I came up short in the process. While I'm still incredibly grateful for the lost media that was given to me, perhaps in time, the developers at Glyphic Entertainment will have a change of heart and give the game a public release. But until then, I'm sorry that this is where the journey must unfortunately end for us. So since things were cut short, I wanted to leave you guys with something special. I decided to give the Clueless game the proper introduction slash send-off it truly deserves. Since it never actually had its own promotional trailer, and since I love editing so much, I've decided to put together my own little fan-made trailer and how I think the game would have been advertised back in 2010, with the help of some notable content creators in the gaming community. Yo, what's up? My name is Blessing Adelia Jr., host and producer at Kinda Funny. Hello, my name is Simone de Rochefort, and I make videos for Polygon. Hello, my name is Abby Russell, and I'm a comedian and also unemployed. I'll be reading the parts of Amber. And lastly joining us, Pokimane as Cher. This is the Clueless Fashion fan trailer. Hey girl, I got an itch. Let's go shopping. You know, Dee, it's not that easy to just say, let's go shopping. I'm a busy girl. I've got a schedule to maintain. Yeah, okay, that's good and all, but did you forget a certain clothing designer's new line comes out today? Jean-Luc Francoise? Oh, how did I forget? I'll be there in 20. Based on the 1995 coming of age teen comedy, 505 Games and Glyphic Entertainment brings you clueless fashion for the Nintendo DS. Follow the Beverly Hills teenager Cher on the road to becoming a famous and up and coming fashion designer. I live in totally the best place on earth, Beverly Hills. Even if I tried, I couldn't imagine things being any better. Create unique fashion designs, stitch together the perfect outfit. Oh, I love makeovers. Let's go upstairs and see what I have. Give your friends the perfect makeover and take on the chance of a lifetime to plan and coordinate your very own fashion event. Don't forget to practice that catwalk. Cher, when you said this place was close to the zoo, I didn't know that meant they let the animals roam the streets too. Whatever. At least I don't wear what they discard. You'd better take that back. I'd never be caught dead in ultra suede. With little time to plan for the main event, how will you wear your look? I feel so lucky. And if there's one wish I could have, it'd be that everyone in the world could feel the same way. Clueless fashion only on the Nintendo DS. With no one else willing to budge with more information on the project, I really thought my search had ended here, which is why I wanted to try and end things on such a lighthearted note. I thanked more for the information and went on my way. I had my hour-long gameplay and had access to the game's user manual. It was a lot of fines for just one person, and it wasn't until after filming all of this that the motherload of all emails would find its way into my inbox. And yes, I promise you, no more fakeouts. This was the real deal. Weeks later, an email from an ex-employee wishing to remain anonymous sent a single message that read, If there is anything else I could help with, please don't hesitate to ask. Have a nice weekend. That email contained a link to a large drive file, and this file contained full chapter breakdowns, a full game design document, asset files like sprites and music, an official company style guide, the in-game script, and then the mother load. Tucked away in the source files was the original DS game. This was the mother load of lost media files, files that I'm about to share with you in the remainder of this video. In order to present this in the most cohesive way, I'll be splitting it into chapters. In this exact order, we'll be diving into the visual style guide, game design document, full chapter breakdown of Clueless Fashion, including gameplay, and testing to see if the ROM is playable on a physical Nintendo DS. Let's begin. This is the official Clueless style guide created by Glyphic Entertainment. This 15-page document is also known in the industry as an art bible, and would have acted as an inspiration board, dictated by the art directors for the team to use as a blueprint for their stylistic approach. The style guide begins with a brief introduction. Clueless. 
The following pages illustrate the general direction for Clueless, the game. The overall direction of the game is to capture the fun and flirtatious style of the film while creating its own unique style. Color palettes will have a girl-friendly theme using softer toned colors. We will set a couple of goals to achieve this. One is to create a visual style guide that is colorful and appealing to girls. We will make sure to use softer hues for menus and bold colors for the fashion and glamour of the runway. We don't want to try to recreate the film, but rather draw inspiration from its visual style. The second is to give the player the experience of living in the shoes of Cher by creating their fashion designs for the world of Clueless. We will give the player the means to create high fashion through a simple and easy to understand interface. The world of fashion design is at your fingertips. The next page brings us straight into palettes and patterns. Palettes and patterns. We want to convey a fun, flirtatious style with our color and pattern choices. To do this, we choose colors that are bright, warm, and stylish. Since Clueless focuses on fashion, the clothing will have bold colors and vibrant patterns to help them jump off the runway. Backgrounds and menus will incorporate some of these colors, but primarily use softer hues and pastel shades so that the focus is always on the fashions the player is creating. Patterns will be used throughout the fashion creation process. Patterns will draw from current fashion fashion trends such as floral, animal, and geometric prints using bold and vibrant color palettes. The clueless interface and menus will be a big part of the game. We want to keep the style of these menus hip and in the spirit of the movie. We will draw on Cher's lifestyle for these screens using items like her laptop, school notebooks, etc. Characters. Instead of matching the likeness of the actors in Clueless, we will adopt a stylistic approach to all of the characters. Our interpretations use oversized proportions on the face, such as the eyes, nose, mouth, etc. The heads are also slightly larger in proportion to the body. This style is currently used in major doll brands and fits into the vision of the game and its target audience. And by big heads, large eyes, and small portions, the company was most likely referring to the very popular line of Bratz dolls that made waves in the early 2000s. Cher, the lead character. Not stupid, but so self-absorbed she misses most of the world around her. Blonde, uses a computer to help her sort through all her clothing. Shopaholic, drives a white Jeep Wrangler. The most popular girl at her school is 15, almost 16, lives in Beverly Hills. Characters, Dion, Cher's best friend, black with cornrow hair, drives worse than Cher, is on the cell phone most of the time. They were both named after early 70s singers. Ty, from the Bronx, an unhip, clueless, new student, taken in hand by Cher. Josh, Cher's stepbrother, falls in love with Cher. An environmentalist mired in philosophy, has a save the world attitude, but is a pragmatist, which keeps him from being annoying. Average looking nice guy. Murray, Dion's boyfriend, drives a red BMW convertible, four-seater, has braces, shaved his head, wannabe gangsta. Christian, pretty boy, Tony Curtis is his idol, dresses in best clothes, drives a classic yellow 1950s convertible. Travis, burnout, skateboarder, think the dull dude, has a thing for Ty. Environments. Our game environments are not limited to the fashion runway. We will use some locations from the movie, such as the mall, school, and club to illustrate Cher's life in Southern California, and incorporate new ones, like a stage in New York City, and France, to show her rise in the fashion world. Environments will use subtle color palettes to help keep the focus on the fashion models walking down the runway. The remaining pages in the document contain style references of trending fashions from that era, and it's apparent that all the trends were considered globally as opposed to what was trending merely in North America at the time. At that very moment, I felt as if my eyes had seen something I was never meant to look at. But what I was about to dive into next was quite literally classified. No, I mean it. The document was marked as classified. This was the Clueless DS game design document. Similar to that of the style guide, a game design guide, also known as a GDD, is a software design document used as a basic outline for all of the game's core mechanics. These documents typically include an executive summary, such as the game's concept, target audience, project scope, game progressions, mission objectives, and game interfaces. The entire 51-page document was marked as confidential. Page 2 outlined the game's concept, pages 3 through 5 broke down the character bios, and from pages 6 to 12 we got the 
the full in-game story from moment to moment, broken down into acts and chapters. The game document also goes over the game mechanics and gameplay of Clueless Fashion, providing mock-up images of the game's UI to help further illustrate how certain sequences would take place in-game. There was even a detailed clothing creation flowchart that demonstrated the step-by-step -step process and multiple options for creating garments. The final pages of the document were filled with sample fashion art, real-world maps, and interiors of a handful of fashion retailers, all to be used as inspiration for the game's assets. In the interest of time, rather than posting the full playthrough of the DS game, I'll instead be reading the full official Clueless Fashion chapter summary from chapters 1 to 21 alongside accompanying gameplay footage I've prepared for each scene. And yes, that means I've played the whole game. Chapter 1, An Introduction The experience starts at home in Cher's bedroom, an internal dialogue where Cher talks about all the wonderful things she's done, thinks, and wants out of life. Shortly after, Cher receives a call from Dion, telling her that the new line of Jean-Luc Francois's clothing has just arrived at a local boutique and asks her if she'd like to go. Chapter 2, Ty's Fashion Emergency Upon Cher and Dion's return from shopping, they are surprised by an unexpected visit from Ty, who has a fashion emergency. Ty needs an outfit for an event that she's expected to attend the next evening. Cher tells her she'd be more than happy to find her something to wear in her closet. The three girls go up to Cher's closet to find Ty something to wear. After picking the outfit, Cher decides she could make it even more special with a slight couple of alterations to the blouse to give it a little more visual flair. With some fabric that was lying around, Cher decides to make Ty something even more special to wear. Cher then creates the perfect outfit for Ty. Chapter 3 making her own outfit. Since Cher was so accommodating, Ty asks her if she'd like to attend the event. Cher enthusiastically agrees, and while she's in a creative mood, decides to make her own outfit for the event. To do that, however, Cher needs to go to the fabric store to pick up a few bits of clothing and maybe a pattern or two. Cher goes to the fabric store the next day to buy supplies. Chapter 4, A Formal Occasion The next night, Cher and Ty attend the benefit event. Discussion spreads throughout the dinner about how beautiful Ty's outfit was put together and that Cher was the one who put it all together. It just so happens that Jean-Luc Francois, the famous clothing designer, is at the event as well. And after meeting Ty, he catches wind of Cher's fashion sense and how she was able to quickly make some alterations to create a unique outfit. Cher finally gets a chance to meet the designer. They talk for a minute or two about fashion and at the end of the conversation, he asks her what she thinks about becoming a fashion designer. Cher just about loses it. She can't believe her ears. She accepts. Chapter 5 Practice Makes Perfect Cher admits she's a little nervous about meeting Jean-Luc. Before going to create clothes for one of the world's most renowned designers, she decides to test out her abilities just to see where her skills at creating clothing lies. Cher decides that her challenge is to make an outfit for a day out with the girls, and even though she's never actually been out golfing, Cher decides to make an outfit that she could wear if she did. Chapter 6 Meeting at the studio. Cher meets with Jean-Luc Francois to discuss fashion and her potential road to success in the industry. Jean-Luc lets Cher know he doesn't just work with anyone, and while he might think she might have a good eye, he needs to be sure. So he gives her a test. Chapter 7 Summer Chic Fashion Challenge Jean-Luc's test for Cher is to go out and buy three different outfits that represents to her what it means to be summer chic. With $4,000 as a budget, Cher drives down to the store, Venice, to to prove she has the skills necessary. After she's done shopping, Cher is asked to arrange the outfit as they are to be worn with colors and styles hopefully matching. Chapter 8 The Softball Team Uniform After the successful completion of the test, Jean-Luc tells Cher he has a very important job for her, one that he thinks she'll have a lot of fun with. Eager to start making lavish gowns and adorable plaid skirts, Cher is instead tasked with creating the uniform for Jean-Luc's daughter's softball team. While not what she was Expecting, Cher decides she can have a lot of fun with this and gets right on it. Chapter 9 Jean Luc's Job Board After an initial set of successfully completed challenges, Jean Luc decides he can start trusting Cher with his company's clients. So, to show his faith in Cher's abilities, Jean Luc opens the job board at his studio so that whenever Cher wants to take on an extra job, she is able to. The job board allows Cher to take on jobs at her leisure and complete them to earn extra funds. At first, only five jobs are available on the job board, and more are to become available later on in the game. After Chapter 9, 
The chapter summaries become a little inconsistent and out of order with the events that are present in the final build of the game. Some chapters have been combined, while others have been outright scrapped. There are subtle differences here and there, and instead of 21 chapters, there are now 19. From here on out, I'll be summarizing the finalized story from chapters 10 onwards. Chapter 10, A Skirt for Jean-Luc After receiving a call from Jean-Luc, praising Cher for her work on his daughter's softball uniform, Jean-Luc then asks her if she'd be willing to participate in his upcoming fashion show, as he is in need of a flared skirt. Cher accepts and proceeds to craft the new outfit. Chapter 11 Fashion Show The fashion show is geared towards showing off the talents of up-and-coming fashion designers, something Jean-Luc is very confident that Cher is. All of Cher's friends come out to see her skirt grace the catwalk for the first time. Her first show is a success. Chapter 12 Clothing Shop of Horrors Cher's creations have caught the eye of Betty, the owner of a local fashion boutique. Betty approaches Cher and asks if she'd be interested in helping her get a couple new fashions for the summer. Cher accepts the position and gets right on helping the best way she knows how. Cher creates a series of summer-styled outfits to try and get the store headed off in the right direction. Chapter 13 Betty's Boutique A day or two after the styles hit the shelves, Cher receives a phone call from Betty telling her that the styles were such a huge success that she's having a hard time keeping them on the shelves. This prompts Betty to asking Cher if she'd like to help her with a couple new complete outfits. Cher accepts the job and goes about creating and arranging several new outfits for the store. Chapter 14 Expanded Job Board Jean-Luc calls Cher to ask how the work is going with the store and mentions how he's been hearing a lot of great things. Jean-Luc mentions how impressed he is and tells Cher to keep up the good work. He also lets Cher know that there are a number of new jobs available on the job board in his office and that she should feel welcome to come down anytime to help out. It is clear that at this point, Jean-Luc sees Cher as much more than just a young fashion designer, and her level of prestige is starting to earn her some proper respect. Chapter 15 Cher's First Fashion Show Part 1 All this work has started an avalanche for Cher. She's seeing an even more positive flow of energy from the world than ever before. Case in point, her success at the fashion boutique has prompted Jean-Luc to call and offer her a fantastic new opportunity, her own complete fashion show outside of Betty's shop. This is a local fashion show to advertise the boutique and showcase many of the articles she's already made for the store and any new articles of clothing she wishes to make special for the occasion. Chapter 16 Cher's First Fashion Show Part 2 With the outfits created, Cher gets ready to see how her fashions get received on stage for the first time. Cher directs the models from the control panel as they participate in the show. The better the presentation, the more the crowd gets into the event, and ultimately, the more they appreciate Cher's ensembles. Chapter 17 Expanding the Task Board Chapter 17 is another chance for the player to visit the job board with five new jobs that make their way to the board. This also gives the player a chance to finish any of the jobs that have not yet been completed from prior chapters. Jean-Luc also gives Cher the heads up on another fashion show opportunity. His friend Rimbaud has an opening in a runway show coming up in New York City, and the first person he thought of was his shining star in the making, Cher. Cher obviously can't believe her ears. This is a chance of a lifetime, and she surely accepts. Pleased, Jean-Luc asks her to create six gowns for the show. Speechless from the opportunity, Cher gets right on to making her dresses. Chapter 18 Winter Runway Show Part 1 Cher reflects on how lucky she is to have this new opportunity to showcase her designs on the runway in New York City. City. Cher then goes out to grab the appropriate patterns and fabrics to craft together six new dresses. Chapter 19 Winter Runway Show Part 2 This is it. It's time for Cher to show her stuff on the big stage. Once in New York City, Cher gets to the center for the event several hours prior so she can take in the entire production. This is a new experience for her, but one she thinks she'll fit into nicely. After relishing the experience for a moment, Cher reminds herself to stay confident and not get consumed by the moment. The final runway challenge commences. Upon a successful show, the possibilities for Cher are endless as she climbs closer to making a name for herself worldwide. And that is the story of Clueless Fashion. I did it. I was one of the only people outside of the Glyphic Entertainment team to play Clueless Fashion, and after completing the entire game on an emulator, I just had to see if the ROM would work on a physical Nintendo DS for the full, authentic experience. So I did what any sane internet detective would do. I put that baby on my R4. And of course, it worked. 
The fan-made trailer I put together was pretty fun, but now I feel like I can really treat you guys. I don't want to be the only one to enjoy this game, so on top of the trailer, I'll be releasing the full playthrough of Clueless Fashion over on my YouTube channel. I'll also be streaming it live over on Twitch so you guys can join in on the fun, and I'll be submitting the original ROM file in English and all the other languages available over on the Internet Archive. And this will all be happening in the days following the premiere of this video, so please subscribe to the channel and follow me over on Twitch and Twitter to support this documentary and also be kept in the loop as to when these events will be happening. Oh, and one more thing. After my search concluded, almost a month later, I did eventually hear back from someone over at Crush Digital Media, and the conversation went a little something like this. Hi, apologies for the delay in replying. Busy time of year. Smile. I am happy to remain anonymous, to be honest. You know, keep the mystery. Some comments below. Merry Christmas. When was Crush Digital Media formed? What was your position at the company? And do you remember how many games the company had released altogether before shutting down? I think it was formed in October 2007. It was active for 18 months only. My position was... Do you know why production of Mean Girls for the Nintendo DS suddenly came to a halt? Mean Girls was completed after Crush was shut down. They did a pre-pack admin deal and reopened as Mayhem Games for a short amount of time. Mayhem Games effectively continued with the projects from Crush with reduced staff. This Phoenix company didn't last very long at all. I don't recall Crush or Mayhem shipping anything. I think Mayhem shipped Freddy Flintoff's Cricket for DS? Can you remember if the team was 100% finished with the game and ready to have it shipped out? Or was production split between Crush Digital and Fuzzy Frog like another employee had speculated? Production of Mean Girls went from Crush to Mayhem to Fuzzy Frog. In the last couple of years, a few people online have come forward stating that they've seen this game on shelves in places like France and Italy. Some people believe the game was actually released in Europe, but never saw an American release due to the game's supposed low ratings. Do you know if the game actually made it to stores in Europe or America? I don't. Fuzzy Frog completed the title and it was up to 505 games and Paramount to ship. We passed Nintendo Lockjack and supplied everything to 505. Did Paramount Entertainment ever give the team at Crush Digital slash Fuzzy Frog an explanation as to why the game was cancelled? No. Some screenshots from this game have surfaced online, leading many to believe that copies of the game must exist somewhere, whether as a ROM file or as a full Nintendo cartridge. I've attached some screenshots in this email. Do you have any of the Mean Girls work in your possession? And would you be willing to share it for this documentary, whether it be more screenshots, the user manual, gameplay, or even the original file? Anything that could bring us a step closer to uncovering this lost media? I don't, sorry. I couldn't even really remember what it looked like until you sent the screenshots. Do the screenshots provided from the game look familiar? Do you remember working on some of these? I do remember the product, now, from the screenshots. Is there anything you can tell us about the game itself? Was it a series of mini-games, a linear story, etc.? It was a story-driven, narrative choice game, as I remember, that triggered mini-games and unlocked parts of the burn book. Do you know of anyone else who worked at the company, the CEO, artists, dev team, etc., who could help provide lost files from this game? Photos, promotional screenshots, gameplay, or even the cartridge file itself? I know a few people that used to work there. I can see if anyone is interested and give them your details. I think that means this case is pretty much closed. An enormous weight had finally been lifted. Now I could truly relate to all of the internet detectives who put all their time and energy into unearthing cancelled and missing media. If given the chance, would I spend almost four months doing it again? Probably. Hit me up, sponsors, I'm down for the challenge. While I wasn't able to find the lost Mean Girls DS game, what I was able to uncover was just as amazing. It's so crazy that I went into this video in search of one bit of lost media and wound up stumbling across something I didn't even know was missing. And I feel lucky enough to have achieved it going in alone. However, I haven't completely lost hope on getting more leads on Mean Girls. I mean, if I was able to solve the clueless mystery and pick up some pieces of the Mean Girls trail, then surely there must be more out there. Not just that, but data breaches happen all the time, with new information coming to the surface. With events like the 2020 Nintendo data leak, it's just proof that in time, things that are seemingly lost can come to surface when people least expect it. And I guess until that day comes, I'll be online with all the other weirdos.
There we go. Oh my god, it's over. It's done. I can finally go to sleep. <laughs>